Hello, I'm John McCarthy, a media reporter at The Drum, and I'm excited to be joined today by Julian Mintz of Roku and Sam Bloom of Camelot. We're going to have a conversation charting the trends and innovation we've seen in the video streaming space these last few months and pick out a few points on advising marketers of how to move in the space. So before we dig into what's happening at Roku specifically, um, I wonder if you could talk about uh, media trends we've witnessed these last few uh, weeks, Julian. Yeah, of course. Uh, specific to the TV space, what we're seeing is an acceleration of trends that started before COVID hit. Uh, and that's really a shift away from linear TV and towards streaming. Uh, I think Nielsen has noted that since January, streaming hours are up in the US over 40%. Whereas linear is actually down 3%. And so the shift that we're seeing towards the ease and the value and the choice that's inherent in streaming uh, is just continuing as people are forced to stay at home and they're increasing their overall TV consumption. And I was reading that there may be perhaps the disappearance of a live sports and events like that are sort of driving people into the OTT experience. Is that truthful? Yeah, we're, we're definitely seeing that as well. I mean, there's been a few market trends in this time. The biggest one is that there are no sports on linear TV. Uh, I like to say sports is kind of the last bastion of linear TV. And without that, I think what we're seeing is many people that were on the fence about cutting the cord are now jumping over that fence. And the trend that we've seen in the past is that users that do cut the cord and move towards streaming is their only source for television usually don't go back. And that's a trend that we expect uh, is going to continue. Uh, and it's interesting, I, we sit as the streaming platform for all of these channels and consumers, really a gateway to streaming. And part of that is we have a direct relationship with our consumer base. And that gives us the ability to derive a lot of really unique insights on the viewership habits of our audience. And so we're seeing some really interesting stuff right now. Uh, there's obviously the top line metrics around hours just being up across the board and things like news viewership um, spiking in a significant way off the bat. Uh, but we're also seeing some other unique things, for instance, around traditional day parts. Uh, normally, Roku viewing mirrors general television viewing as it pertains to time of day. We see the largest amounts of viewership in the morning and in the evening. Cut to everybody staying at home, and we've actually seen that flipped on its head, uh, where we're seeing daytime hours growing faster than any other day part and actually surpassing those morning and those prime time hours as well. Uh, so that's something interesting that we've seen. Uh, we also, uh, we understand what viewers on our platform are watching and we're able to look at things like, okay, a viewer that traditionally watches the NBA or the NHL on linear, and I use those two examples because they'd be right in the middle of their playoffs right now. And we can also see what they're watching instead. So they've come to Roku uh, and now they're watching things like TV shows, movies, news, lifestyle content instead of that traditional sports content. Julian, I wonder if you could tell me how Roku fits into this uh, booming streaming space, uh, sort of what its mission statement is and sort of how it facilitates this uh, boom and viewing. Yeah. Yeah. So we Roku's been a, America's number one streaming platform for many years now. And we really look at ourselves as the gateway to streaming for audiences looking to cut the cord, for content providers looking to reach those audiences, and for brands looking to enter the space. Uh, on the content side, we provide a distribution mechanism into American homes. Uh, and on the, on the consumer side, we really focus around three key pillars, ease of use, all the best content and value. And we feel like those three drivers uh, really play a big factor into the decision of a consumer on whether to cut the cord or not. So we really stay grounded in those three pillars. Uh, and then on the brand side, we realize that it's a rapidly changing and dynamic ecosystem where TV screen as a vehicle to reach 
especially in the linear world, is just not what it used to be. And that there's a new world in streaming that offers the opportunity to capture TV viewers. And we're really focused around building the best possible platform that, that takes advantage of all of the digital elements inherent in the OTT space, uh, while still staying focused around great content and great ad experience. So I wonder if you could tell me what sort of conversations you could be having with clients, uh, you know, what sort of creative solutions you have and where they could expect to see their event inventory turning up. Um, I just wonder how you would guide them into the space. Yeah, I think the, the primary driver for brands testing the OTT space is the concept of reach. Uh, it's the same screen that they're used to in terms of their brand media. Uh, the same great content, the same effectiveness, but it just has an incremental audience that they're no longer reaching on linear TV. But then what we look to do is bring all of the elements inherent in digital, uh, things like data and targeting, interactivity, uh, different high impact content programs to make their advertising more efficient, more effective, have less waste. Uh, and then lastly, we've really rooted our ad product in measurement. Uh, we want for brands that enter the space for the first time to understand that this space can be really effective in driving against their KPIs, whether it's just reach or whether it's something further down the funnel, like a site visitation or driving the user uh, into a brick and mortar location. Um, those are things that we've been really leaned in on to prove that the platform works and to keep people coming back. And of course, you had some new news recently to share the new product, uh, One View, that you released. Um, I wonder if you could speak me through how that came to market and just what sort of problems that's solving. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, One View, just to, to take a step back, it is a single platform rooted in TV data from America's number one streaming platform that allows brands to plan, activate, and measure media across not just OTT, but mobile and desktop as well, really an omnichannel solution. Uh, and its um, ultimate result is that we can reach four and five users, or four and five households in the US. Uh, so this came as part of our acquisition of DataZoo a few months ago. Uh, and really the, the impetus behind it was this idea that uh, we were bringing a solution that we thought was superior to market around Roku and around the OTT space, uh, but understanding that we sat on some unique assets that could help brands uh, plan and measure holistically across all of their media, first and foremost in that being around the concept of identity. Uh, Roku users and Roku the company has a direct connection to their consumer. Our consumers are logged in the entire time that they're using Roku. And so our ability to understand that it's Sam Bloom's household that's watching Roku um, is really unparalleled in the space and has applications across uh, both targeting and measurement across all screens. Uh, and so we really wanted to bring this concept of identity and help brands activate and measure um, using this superior solution. And speaking of uh, Sam Bloom's household, um, what sort of uh, segments would you say OTT is the best place to reach? Um, now we're in four out of five US households, for example. Um, what audiences would be best reached with this product? For many of our clients, one of the first things we do, I mean, most of our clients are very large advertisers with large customer bases. And so one of the first things we do is we take our clients' anonymized and hashed customer file and bump it up against uh, Roku's data so that we can actually see consumption of both OTT and linear, by the way, for those, for those customer sets. And we can look at consumption uh, as it exists. And then we can tailor those plans to the customer segments that are most valued for our clients. And so uh, we've and that, by the way, that's a process we've been working on with Roku since day one. Um, and then the second piece of it is then as you run campaigns, depending on how you, you know, sort of segment your campaigns, you can actually see performance, uh, both, you know, sort of 
transactional performance as well as other kinds of metrics like brand awareness and lift and recall and all those kinds of things. And I'd say, you know, certainly performance in real time, but those other things you can sort of gauge throughout the campaign and you can adjust accordingly. And then, you know, post campaign, you can, you know, do a wrap up and what happened and what didn't happen. Because Roku is digital, you can measure, you know, transactional things, not only on a client's website, but in their app. And then of course, you can combine other kinds of data sets, such as, uh, you know, geolocation data set, where you can understand sort of control and expose. Did they, did they see an ad and did they walk into your store or your, you know, or your restaurant? And so those kinds of things make a huge difference uh, in being able to sort of tailor campaigns to specific audiences. Thanks for that. It seems that there's a lot of real-time data and it takes a lot of the pain out of tracking a campaign. And uh, maybe advertisers can use sort of different dynamic messages and reach certain groups. And it was interesting you were talking about uh, sort of the older audience getting more with the service now as well, um, even though it's still predominantly a sort of longer than linear. Um, now that we've got an idea of how the campaigns can run and be measured, um, I wonder if you could tell me how you're helping brands deliver creative solutions for this space, um, just what's needed and how you're helping them meet those demands. You know, it's interesting. I mean, you know, when when COVID hit, I'll tell you the one, I'll tell you an anecdote that I think is really interesting. So, uh, so I have a brother-in-law who is uh, he's a hydrogeologist, a professor at a local university here. And one of the things that he said that was really interesting to me is when COVID hit, basically, you know, there were cars off the road. And he said that there that their seismometers around the country and frankly around the world were hearing uh you know seismic shifts like they never had before because of all the noise from the cars had been removed. And so what I was gonna to say to you what's been very interesting in the COVID period, if you if you think about it as an analogy, you know, we're seeing some seismic shifts. Uh, as it relates to consumption. And one piece of the consumption, obviously, is the transition, you know, sort of the momentum from linear to OTT or connected TV. But there's also a second piece of that, and, you know, that's a parallel, which is uh, people using e commerce. To add to that, one thing that's so wildly impressive about Camelot is the agility with which they move and the, and the speed with which they move. So when COVID first hit, the ability for Camelot to uh, gain an understanding and share that understanding with their client base of exactly what this climate looked like using data from a variety of different sources. R Roku was happy to be one of those. It was truly impressive some of the reporting that they put together. And that was sort of the, the first step in that process as they were to help their clients, able to help their clients understand as best as possible exactly what the media landscape and the business landscape looked in this odd time that we're in now. Uh, so that, that was really impressive. And then secondarily, I think we've been able to work together to lean on um, some different media executions that could help brands adapt to their new business realities. So a few of the things that we've done, for instance, have been around sponsorships. So we started Home Together which lives on the Roku channel, our free ad supported channel um, that has sort of all of the best content for free that users can access during the stay at home period. And we've really tailored it towards uh, a lot of uh, the endemic nature of being at home. So having TV shows and movies, but also having cooking and fitness and education content. Uh, brands that work with Sam were some of the first to jump into that space to sponsor that content and to make sure that it was easily accessible uh, for, for the stay at home viewer. Also around things like interactivity, when we talk about e-commerce, uh, we're able to adjust creative using interactivity. So an overlay that runs on TV ads that can point a user towards online ordering. Uh, so the ability to be really nimble with creative knowing that the creative that you had in market pre-COVID might not work anymore right now. And I think the last part of that is also just general creative services. Uh, there isn't production really happening right now. 
And so a brand that had creative and market pre-COVID that was no longer appropriate for this time period might not have the production resources to adjust that creative. And so we're working uh, with our own internal team to be able to provide those services back to brands as well. So they can very quickly, for instance, take a static ad that runs on Instagram, turn that into sight, sound, and motion and get that up on the effectiveness of the TV screen as well. Uh, so we're, we're working with agencies like Camelot who are able to move fast and pivot really to help their brands uh, get into market and still reach users, but with more appropriate messaging for this time. You know, a couple of tangible examples. I mean, Julie and I, Julian and I and, and the road team have learned a couple of things. So uh, we have one client where we've had uh, successive years of sponsoring the biggest event, sporting event of the year on an annual basis. Um, and as a part of that package, we, we also bought the NCAA tournament. And as you know, the NCAA tournament uh, was canceled. We pivoted uh, uh, to a sponsorship on a, an important weekend for our client. And one of the things we learned was that uh, that sponsorship over that weekend, uh, let's call this in the post-COVID period, actually was almost two or three X bigger than the big game sponsorship that we had. That, that tells you how much things have changed in a very short period of time. Because it, prior to COVID, if you had told me that there was anything bigger than the big game, I would have said, no way. Uh, and so that was one key learning that I thought was really, really, really interesting. The second one, I want to touch on what Julian talked about, the creative piece. Uh, you know, we have uh, clients that, uh, you know, spent months building areas that were, uh, frankly, no longer appropriate for the COVID period. And working with the Roku team, uh, they've built out some pretty interesting tools to be able to take uh, existing assets that you might be running in, say, social, and turning those assets into actionable OTT ads. And, you know, again, uh, some of that stuff has proven to be far more productive than what I'll call the fancy produced ads that, you know, you take months and months to prepare. And I think, you know, that's been one of the missing elements on this is that, you know, I think clients, uh, you know, have underestimated um, the power of being able to do really interesting creative things. Um, and Julian even referenced doing overlays. You know, you can do an overlay for an app install. Um, and one of the things that's nifty about that is that you can tie uh, performance of app install directly to, you know, a Roku campaign. So, you know, I think, you know, the reality of this situation that we've all been in is that, uh, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, right? And we've all had to pivot. And I think what, what we realize is, you know, in a platform like Roku, uh, you can pivot much faster with more specificity and granularity than you can in virtually any other you know big screen format it's very impressive that's very interesting um i believe that the sort of with the product currently being set up and in its early sort of months um there's an agility there and right now forcing everyone to adapt it's a really interesting time to cover the industry um now looking forward a bit, I wonder, uh, Julian, if you can tell me how you would like to improve the product going forward, and then following that, Sam could maybe say how he would like to see it improved, and we'll see if there's a consensus, or maybe we'll get some uh, good ideas going. <laughs> yeah, we we constantly strive for innovation, uh, thanks in large part to, to our partners. Uh, Camelot has been a great partner not only in adapting to our platform as we grow and, and really being a beta for a lot of the new things that we do, but also always providing really great feedback as we continue to build products and optimize products that best meet advertiser needs. So, so that's been a great part of our partnership. Uh, really the, the path forward for us in the near term is uh, primarily rooted in our OneView product. Uh, and that really was born out of feedback from the marketplace. That there were some real challenges 
that brands came up against as they entered into the OTT space. And they really entered into that space out of necessity, just given how viewership is changing. Um, but then once they got there, there, there are some things that they need us to help solve. Uh, one of those is really how does OTT tie into the rest of a brand's media activity? How does it sit next to linear on a TV buy? How does it interact with more lower funnel tactics? Uh, and that's really what OneView is able to help solve for. It's an omnichannel platform. It's all rooted in this really strong logged in data source, uh, but it provides a holistic look at all of a brand's media activity. Uh, so we can do something, for instance, like a path to purchase. We can help understand how an incremental TV viewer who didn't see an ad on linear TV, but was exposed in OTT, we can see what they did from a media perspective on their way to converting at a car dealership or downloading an app. Uh, those are learnings that, that the highest level uh, within brands are really interested in and stuff that we want to help provide them. And then even more sort of basic, uh, brands entered the OTT space and they found fragmentation. They found platforms like Roku and some of the other platforms out there. A lot of our channel partners all sell ads as well. There's different programmatic offerings. Uh, Sam can probably speak to this, but, but there's a good bit of fragmentation out there and a lot of different choices. At the end of the day, the goal is to reach as many people as possible, um, but at the same time, needing to do so in a coherent way. And so how does a brand, for instance, manage frequency? at the household level. So if they're running an ad on our platform and also running an ad on some of our channel partners, how do they make sure that there's no duplication and that they're ultimately hitting their household frequency goals? Uh, managing for holistic TV household reach and frequency is something that the OneView platform is gonna solve uh, right away with a linear component as well. And so that's something that we're really excited about in the near term, uh, excited about all the adoption that we're seeing in the marketplace. Well, it's interesting that as we sort of look down the path, I mean, the thing that I see that's the most amazing thing is, you know, uh, first from the client perspective, which is, I think, to a client, uh, if they had three, four, five year kind of business plans, that time has been compressed dramatically. Uh, and I think that's the first piece is ultimately, you know, we customize our, you know, media plans to each client. Um, and I think that you've got a, a number of kind of macro events that are important. I think the first piece right now, obviously, we don't know what's going to happen with sports. Uh, and we know that a lot of consumption has moved to connected TV. Uh, and so I think the first piece is, to Julian's point, is taking advantage of the scale of the OTT has right now and what I'll call effectively the behavior modification that's occurred. Um, because I don't, I think once you sort of migrate behaviors, uh, it becomes really hard to change those behaviors. And so I think we're, you know, I, it, let's put it this way. If you're in Roku shoes, you probably had a three-year plan of growth, and that just happened in one year for all intents and purposes. And so from a, from a practitioner standpoint, what that scale enables is being able to, to run a lot more different kinds of playbooks. And we talked about this a little earlier. Uh, the, the brand sponsorship playbook was always pretty straightforward on Roku. Uh, and even the performance play was pretty straightforward on Roku. I think the local piece is very interesting. And the reason I sort of say that is I think the biggest probably challenge going forward when you think about the TV business is really local TV in the purest sense because um, everyone tends to look at things on a national basis the reality of it is that uh, viewership occurs locally and then gets aggregated, aggregated up on a national basis. And so depending on a you know, client's footprint, uh, you can do some really interesting things in a very targeted way on a very local basis. And I think that has huge implications for media buying. And then you have tools like Roku uh, that are now giving us what I'll call the weather forecast or forecasting for impressions and consumption and helping us anticipate things. See, I think that's the biggest piece, you know? And so I think, you know, Roku is in a fantastic position and connected TV as a whole is in a fantastic position. Um, 
And, you know, I'd say there's, there's two or three elements of Roku that I think are interesting. Now, I'm going to talk about those two or three elements. Remember, Roku can see what you're consuming on linear TV and what you're consuming on connected TV. You can, from a creative perspective, do some things wildly different in connected TV than you can do in linear TV. I guess I'd also just be remiss not to mention sort of Roku as a whole. The, the company as a whole, I think, is just going to continue to iterate on those three core pillars, ease of use, mm -hmm. all the best content, and then value. So it's going to be an interesting next year. Uh, big media companies are still rolling out um, streaming services. So you have HBO Max coming out. Peacock is going to launch soon. Roku is going to continue to be the home for all the best content. And we want to make it really easy for our users to find, sample, and view that content. Uh, what we also see in the next year is the continued acceleration and development of ad-supported content. Uh, ad-supported content is really the fastest segment in terms of growth of viewership hours on our platform. And so with that, we want to continue to bring these new premium subscription services, but we're also helping cord cutters find all the best free content as well throughout the platform. And a big place where that's happening is on our owned and operated channel, the Roku channel. So in terms of the path forward, we still want to have all of the best content, uh, but we're going to continue to place focus on value and bringing uh, really terrific, free, easy to find content to consumers as well. Fascinating. And we're seeing a lot of ad supported services coming, as you said, um, and we'll be keeping a very close eye on that in the coming year or so. Um, obviously, we've had a lot of a premium tiered a subscription video like Disney Plus launching and your Netflixes, but um, it's definitely worth keeping an eye on them. Um, well, gentlemen, I've uh, asked all the questions that I had prepared um, and I could keep you here for hours upon hours. Um, I wonder if there's any points any of you would like to maybe jump back into or reiterate or if anything you think we've missed in this discussion. No, this has been great. Uh, thank you both. Thank you, Sam, for joining. Appreciate the, the partnership as always. I thought this was a great discussion.